slap my head. I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead. And from the ground their blossoms red. The light that shall endless be. When Brother Kurt asked us if we'd remember that song when he gave it to us uh, to sing this Sunday, I, uh, when I was looking at it, I didn't remember what it was, and then we found some music to kind of come along with it, and I was familiar with, with what it was, but it's a very beautiful hymn, beautiful. Uh, I could just keep singing that. It's kind of one of those when our... Uh, Reminds me when our girls were younger and they were learning to play the piano. There were certain of those uh, songs that they would play on the piano that touched my heart and I could just lay on the couch and listen and listen and listen time and time again. This is one of, this is one of those hymns to me that I could just listen and listen and listen. And Shelly, you need to mark this down because I, I would love to hear you play that one for us on the saxophone. I would love, I'd love to have that one played. It would be a beautiful, very beautiful. And maybe even, uh, since I know that we got two around, maybe that would be even something that Shannon could accompany or Taryn. <laughs> See what the Lord would have for it. But you know, the, I am just still glad that we are that we're holding to the old rich hymns that God has given us. You know, Shelly and I were shopping yesterday in Billings, and it, it, was a, it was one of those late days, a long day in Billings, and then coming back and trying to get some things organized and ready here. And uh, of course, Shelly had to find a, a, a dress for this wedding that we're going to. So we were in quite a few stores. Two. two. <laughs> she says two. But I, I don't know. <laughs> the, way, the way that we were, I think, I think we looked at just about every dress there was to look at in the mall. But this, this is a comment that Shelly made as we were, as we were looking. You know, no, that one's too, like, today. And then there was a few that, well, no, those are just a little bit maybe too old. But these are, these are right, within, uh, right within my, uh, my area of things. But I was kind of chuckling that, you know, we've, we've reached that time in our, in our life where we're not looking for the things that are right now in, but trying to find those things that still appeal to where you are. <laughs> you know, Carol's shaking her head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, well, that's where we were, and that's just really what um, the hymns remind me of. They are so great, and they are so rich. And we've moved out, and we've moved away from them. And uh, I'm kind of off the, the subject of what I'm going to preach about, but I want you just thinking about it. That, that's just what that hymn really did to me. I, when we were leaving our Thursday night Bible study, um, I was talking with uh, Paul Sapp. And uh, Brother Paul Sapp would love to be here in fellowship with us Sunday. That's his heart. Um, but being able to bring... Uh, his wife along to the hymns. Uh, she grew up kind of in the, the contemporary uh, time frame of, of singing, so she's really drawn to that, that contemporary side of those things. And this is the illustration that he gave her. Paul, Paul was raised on hymns too, uh, in the church that he grew up in. And he's gone away and kind of where he is now, more contemporary things. And, but he said, you know, this is what, how I try to describe it to my wife. 
you know, if you think of dancing, you know, there's like hip hop dancing and all those types of things that just people are doing, and there's not even maybe any rhythm to what you're doing when you're dancing, but yet you're dancing. <laughs> Ron's laughing at that. But you're dancing, but he says, I want you to liken it to, you know, you, he, he's talking to his wife, you, you dance. And what dance did you like the best out of all the dances that you did growing up? And guess what it was? It would be ballet. Isn't that? Well, he used that as an illustration to say, you know, the hymns are like ballet. You know, they're not jumping around and doing all those other things. But when you do ballet, you have to refine things a little bit more. Each movement, it's graceful. And he likened that exactly to how the old hymns are in our life, is, is likening it to that. And I appreciated his illustration that he gave in, in opening my eyes up and using that for his own wife because she wasn't the one that liked all that other hip hop stuff as much as ballet. What a great illustration. I love the hymns. And that one spoke to my heart. And I hope it spoke to your heart as we sing that. Oh, love that will not let me go. Love that will not let me go. We are going to be this morning in... Exodus chapter 19. That's not any guarantee that we're going to stay there. We might move around to a couple other places too. Um, but we are in a, a study currently that we've been looking at uh, the eight great covenants of the Bible. And we've covered several of them so far. Uh, the ones that we have covered is the, uh, the very first one, the Edenic covenant or Eden's covenant. A lot of people think that Edenic were just kind of a couple of those ones that I was talking about in Sunday school that are harder to pronounce or, or they just don't sound maybe right, right? Eden's covenant, Edenic covenant. But what we learned with the Edenic covenant it, is it, uh, it was a time of innocence. It brought in that dispensation of innocence where man and woman were innocent in God's eyes. They had not sinned. And we know that the sign of that covenant was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we moved from that one. We went to the second covenant, which was the Adamic covenant. And this conditioned the, the life of fallen men. And through that, we looked at the fivefold judgment. And that fivefold judgment, what we can see, the sign of that covenant. It ushered in, if you remember, the time or the dispensation of conscience, moral conscience, uh, before God. And then we move from there to the third, which was the Noahic covenant or Noah's covenant, which reaffirmed the Adamic covenant in many areas, but also ushered in a new dispensation, a dispensation of government. And the sign, who knows, remembers what the sign of the Noahic covenant is. The rainbow was the sign. Last week we looked at the fourth great covenant that God has made, and that was the Abrahamic covenant, which brought in the creation of the nation of Israel. The beginning of Israel as a nation was brought in during that time. Also it uh, brought in the dispensation, if you remember, of promise. The dispensation of promise. There was many promises, but the main promise that there would be the seed that would come, which would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And who remembers what the sign of the Abrahamic covenant is? Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And from Abraham's time, as we move through history, that's what we're doing with these eight covenants. God's moving us right through history right up to the end of the times through the millennial kingdom on where eternity will begin. But from 
Abraham, we know that he had the son Isaac, and we looked at a little bit that Abraham last week went to Calvary, didn't he? Where he offered up his only son, which looked ahead to what would happen with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob and Esau. And Jacob became Israel, didn't he? Israel, in the land of Canaan, but then there, you know, he had 12 sons, and we already know the story. I'm just reviewing a little bit. We know the story that, you know, there was one of those boys by the name of Joseph who had dreams, you know, and, and his dad gave him a coat of many colors, and his brothers were really jealous of all of that, and they wanted to destroy him. They wanted to kill him. They come up with a great scheme, didn't they? And uh, I think it was the oldest brother, Reuben, that decides to say, I don't think we ought to take his life. But hey, here's some Ishmaelites. Let's sell him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. And then we'll uh, fake a death. And we'll bring his coat back to dad and say, you know, wild beasts got him and he died. And that's what happened in history, didn't he? But Joseph wasn't dead. He went, the Ishmaelites sold him then into uh, Israel, not Israel, but Egypt to Pharaoh. And we know that story too, how he became great, just like his dream said. He became great in Egypt. And then there was that famine in the land of Canaan. And we know that they kind of went down there. Some of the boys went down other than Benjamin stayed back with dad. Because dad wanted to make sure nothing happened to that youngest boy, like happened to Joseph. And they go down and don't know who he is. And, and then they go back. And, you know, then eventually Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. And they go and bring all Jacob and the whole family to Egypt. Anybody remember about how many it was? Number wise? Taryn? Nope, you usually remember some good numbers. Shelly? Sometimes you got. Nope. It was about 75. Go down into Egypt in the area of Goshen, then not too far away, right? Goshen there. And then Joseph dies and Many of them die, and a new pharaoh is raised up in Egypt and forgets about Joseph, and forgets about all the family, and bring them to the hard tasks of labor, don't they? Where they're working for Pharaoh, working for hard labor. Leavenworth, right? Leavenworth right there in Egypt. Leavenworth, hard work. But then God raised up Moses, the deliverer. And Moses went to Midian for a while, didn't he? came back to deliver them out of Egypt. The ten plagues, we remember that coming upon. They cross the Red Sea. And once they get across the Red Sea, they come to what place? Anybody know the place? Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai is where Moses receives the next covenant, the Mosaic covenant covenant, the fifth covenant that we see in the Bible. And I want to read just a little bit here. You're in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice, Indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. 
And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. He was an intercessor, wasn't he? Moses was. But he didn't have to tell them. God already knew what they said. But he was that intercessor between them and God. What was the Mosaic Covenant given to Moses on Mount Sinai here after they came out of Egypt? Well, it ushered in a new dispensation. It ushered in the dispensation of law. The dispensation of the law, the Mosaic law. And also, there happened to be a sign of this covenant. I'm going to test you with this one. See if anybody knows what the sign of this covenant might be. Yeah, Shannon says, the Ten Commandments? No, it's not the Ten Commandments. That's, a, that, that's what I would have said, though. It is. I will look it up here. I want us to read it. We see it in... Uh, Chapter number 31 is actually where it is. What did you say? The temple? Not the temple. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good uh, response. Guess. <laughs> that's a good guess. Shannon says, guess? You told me I'm guessing. <laughs> Chapter 31, verse 12. I'm going to read and then we'll see if we know what it is here. It says, And the Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the sign was the Sabbath day. Anybody ever think that that would have been it? I, I, would, I would have uh, guessed the same thing that Shannon and Lee did. Lee didn't like that guess. No, I think Shannon rubbed it in just a little bit. <laughs> she did. Uh, so the sign is the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. Well, we know that there was some conditions of obedience upon this, don't we? But I want to look at three focal things that this that this covenant really focused on. Three main things. That it was divided into three main parts. You probably might know what they all are, but you might not. And I'm not going to read all the scripture that deals with all three parts because we would probably be here for quite a bit of time to establish all of it. It would take quite a bit of time. But the first one it consisted of, I listed it if you're following along in your notes, it consisted of the commandments or what we call the moral Law, the moral law, the commandments, and you know, it usually referred to, if we think of the moral law or the commandments, or you say that to anybody, what they normally say is what Shannon said, the Ten Commandments. That was really the moral part of the law, the Ten Commandments, the moral part. But not only did it consist of those commandments or the moral law, it also consisted of a second part, which were the judgments. The judgments, or we could call it civil law. The civil law. And that had to do with, like, the master-servant relationship. It had to do with injuries, property, crimes, lands, feasts, even a little bit of worship, husband-wife relationships. All of those things brought into that civil Part of the law. So the moral part of the law, the civil part of the law. And then there's the last part of the law, which would be the ordinances or the ceremonial part of the law. The ceremony, which really governed all of 
if you want to call it the religious life or the spiritual life of Israel. And most of this was summed up in some areas that even Lee had mentioned. The temple or the tabernacle was a part of that. The priesthood was a part of that. And then the order of the services, everything that was to govern everything all around that. That was the ceremonial part of the law. You know, back at the uh, Noah's covenant, we got the dispensation of government, didn't we? You remember I mentioned at that time that like in Numbers and other places in the Bible, God defines it a little bit more, that government? So what we're seeing I th is the government of Israel being laid out through the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law to govern them as a nation, as a people. You know, that's where we see the beginning of what? That government institution. And God was going to use Israel to go before all other nations and teach them who God was through the moral law, the civil law, the ceremonial law. And we really know the history. We've got to know this for our current time, though. We know, starting with Israel going into the Babylonian captivity, it started a new time. A time that we call the time of the Gentiles. The time of Gentile world rule. And from that time all the way to our current time is Gentile world rule. It will come to an end at the end of the tribulation period. It will. When the millennium's ushered in and Christ reigns on the, the throne, that will happen. But there are a couple aspects of this that I want us to see with this uh, getting back to the ordinances or the ceremonial law and also the commandments, the judgments, the moral law, the civil law. The first two, the commandments and the judgments, what they formed for Israel is what they were to show them is that there is condemnation and there is death. Condemnation and death. And I want to look at a scripture in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, if you move over that way with me, over into the New, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 6 says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more to the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. The law brought condemnation and death, didn't it? It brought condemnation and death. But yet that formed the commandments and that formed the judgments. No man could keep all the moral law and no man could keep the civil law. You could not. So what did God give? He gave the ceremonial law, didn't he? He gave the ceremonial law, a place in which Israel could come and make their lives right before the Lord through sacrifice. The whole temple and all that spoke of pointed to Jesus, didn't it? Right to Him. That there was grace in God's eyes. There was grace. And I'm not going to read it, but if we went to Leviticus 16, about 1 through 6, we would see the sin offering. That the high priest went in and offered once a year for the nation, right? One lamb for what? An entire nation. That they could come and believe in the saving God of Israel. Is Christ in this covenant? We know Christ is in this covenant, don't we? We see Him in it. I want you to reflect on this, though, as we see Christ in this covenant. You see, Israel misinterpreted the law. Israel misinterpreted it. They did. They thought that righteousness was in the law and the commandments 
in the civil law, and really even in the ceremonial law. They thought life was in the system. But life was not in the system. The life has always been in a person. In a person. That's where life has always been. They missed it. I want to I reflect on some of this missing that they did in, in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. We can see it developed even on into the New Testament time here. Acts 15.1 says, and, a certain, and, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's the law. That's the letter of the law, isn't it? So they were trying to bring in the letter of the law. And no, no, it's by grace through faith, isn't it? Not in the law. You know, I love uh, Romans chapter 9. If you don't understand Romans chapter 9, I spoke this before and I'm going to speak it again. If you do not understand Romans 9, 10, and 11, you're not going to understand the difference between Israel and the difference between the church. You're not. You've got to understand what happens right in this area right here in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And there are so many people that have misinterpreted it. They have a misunderstanding of it. And it's lead, led them into great error. It has. Starting in verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, didn't they? We know the stumbling stone's Jesus. They stumbled at it. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Brethren, Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Oh, he's praying that his, his people, he was Israel. He was the tribe of Benjamin, wasn't he? He was, an Israel of Israel. Brethren, my heart's desire for, and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a, a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Oh, they had a great zeal, didn't they? For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law. Israel was right there. This whole 9, 10, and 11 is talking about this. That Jesus Christ came to His own. You can see that, and I'm not going to read it, but in John chapter number 1, verses 10 and 11, He came to His own, and His own what? Knew Him not. His own knew Him not. As He came to a Jew. He came to the Jews. He came to the nation of Israel. The rock. And what did they do over that rock? But they stumbled. They wouldn't believe. They wanted to keep the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. And that's where they thought they had righteousness in life. And no, they didn't. Christ was the righteousness. Well, what does God do with Israel? This is what we see in 9, 10, and 11. He sets them aside temporarily, doesn't he? And now he's dealing with the church. That doesn't mean Israel can't come, does it? They can come. They can believe, but as a nation under God, Almighty God, it's not going to happen until the beginning of the tribulation when the church is taken out. That's the time it's going to happen. But he set them aside. See, if you can understand that, you can understand chapter 9. Do you know what chapter 9 talks about? Mercy. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. You know who he's talking about? Israel. So you've got to get that vision and understand that. You know, he talks about Pharaoh. He talks about uh, Jacob and Esau. 
nations. But what so many people take chapter 9 and talk about election, that God predetermined or chose some men to salvation, and He chose some men to that damnation. If you understand He's speaking right here to Israel, and what happened to them, you can understand when He says, I made, if I make a vessel under honor, or if I make a vessel into judgment, what's that have to do with you? He's speaking to Israel because they were what? A vessel of honor. They rejected the Messiah. So what he's saying, you're now a vessel of what? Dishonor because you've disbelieved in me. You dis See, so many people say that. That's, he's talking to every one of us there. He's speaking directly to Israel. And we've got to understand that. We've got to understand it to know what he's saying. 9, 10, and 11. Oh, Israel rejected the Messiah. But I, just like Paul said, his desire was that Israel would be saved. So we want to reach the Jews, right? What is it? Uh, Benjamin Net Netanyahu, an Orthodox Jew in Israel, quotes, stands on the Bible but he needs the Lord, doesn't he? He's an Orthodox Jew. He needs to see Jesus Christ. Brother Kurt and I were talking with somebody going door to door who is, well, she wasn't sure if she's an Orthodox Jew or a Messianic Jew. She was in between, but we want to take her to Christ, don't we? We want her to see the Lord Jesus Christ and, and be saved. Well, see, the law taught five things. I want to give you these five things probably pretty quick because I don't want to get and in, in end us up here. The five things the law taught was the holiness of God. And I don't know about you. I tried to give, I found some pretty good pictures of Mount Sinai. But I had to, the only one that I could get to actually put on the bulletin here is just more of a drawing of Mount Sinai. There were some other great ones. I wanted you to actually see what it looked like. I don't know about you, but if you would have been there in that day and that time, when God was there speaking to Moses on the mountain, and there was thunderings and there was lightnings, and speaking and things going on, you know, I think I would have been caught in that place to magnify. I want to say magnify the Lord, the great God that's created all. That was what part of that law was for was to elevate the holiness of a great, righteous God. But also, it was to show that we're exceedingly, exceedingly sinful. The exceedingly sinfulness of sin. I want to read from Romans 7, 13. It says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by, by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. God wanted to make that sin in our lives become exceedingly sinful, and He was going to do it through the law of God, through the law, moral law, civil law, ceremonial law. And then we see the necessity for obedience. Man was to be in obedience to the law. The third thing that we see, or the fourth thing actually, is the, universe, the, the universal of sin. That sin is upon all, right? What does Romans 3.23 say? Anybody? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody is a sinner. But in God's marvelous plan with the law, again, He brings grace, doesn't He? He being, brings grace to man, if they would see it, providing a way for man to approach a holy and righteous God. That's what it all was to speak to Israel. And Israel took it to think that they needed to obey. They needed to keep the letter of the law and that in that was life. And there was no life in that. In ending, Jesus, be, he's the one that lived sinless underneath the Mosaic law. He lived sinless. He kept the moral law. He kept the civil law. And he kept the 
ceremonial law. And he became the fulfillment of all that was to speak to Israel. The rock. And they stumbled over the rock, didn't they? I want to end in reading Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Every one of us, every person in Israel was cursed. Because there wasn't one person that could keep the law. You could not keep the law. You could not. Cursed are men and women. But that no man, verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. You know, if we go back to Habakkuk, we did a study on that not too long ago. Habakkuk says the same thing, the just shall live by faith. They shall live by faith way back even in the Old Testament. There's another example back there too. And the law is is not a faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And I think that's what Elaine was testifying to up here this morning when she said, Why, Lord, we are cursed. Why would you become the curse for us? Why would you do that, Lord? I just can't wrap my mind around it. But you did, and I thank you for it, that we are saved by God's grace. Saved by, He became the curse for you. And I thank you, Jesus, for doing that. You became the curse. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Going back and even speaking to the Abrahamic covenant. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. Promises made. He saith not to seeds with an S, as of many, but as to one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Way back to Abraham, the promise of the seed. Even in the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, all fulfilled in Christ. For you and I today, we are not under the law. We are under the law of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we don't obey the law. That doesn't mean we follow the law. What that means is now we can keep the moral law. Now we can keep the civil law. And now we can keep, if you want to say, ceremonial law, which is our worship, right? Our elevating the Lord Jesus Christ. All that the tabernacle and all that the temple meant. Worshiping our great Savior only in Him. Are we made righteous? And can we do? I thank the Lord that we are not under the law, but we are under grace, mercy, the law of Christ in our lives, in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming a curse for me, giving me new life. Oh, you know, we need to reach other people all around us, don't we? There are people that are dying every day around us that don't know Jesus Christ. Let us reach them. Let us share the most precious gift that was ever shared with me. And that was when a man of God came to my home with the Word of God and shared Jesus Christ. You see how important it is? You see how... I was struggling with door-to-door ministry. I'm, I'm kind of on this thing. I've been on this for, for a while now. I was struggling with going door-to-door and being obedient and doing it. Lord, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. 
But you know how I got saved? A man of God came to my door and knocked with the Word of God, and I got saved. Brother Kurt and I went door to door where the Lord led us one day, a couple weeks ago, and a young man bowed his knee and accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. We haven't seen him here yet, but we still need to. We're not leaving him alone, are we? We're going to still try and get him in here. Man of God, or a woman of God, to the door to expose him to the gospel. I know it's not comfortable, but we have seen great rewards. In what God's doing, what he's capable of doing. Let us move together. Let us reach other people and show them the, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my Savior today. I'm going to end and pray, and I'm going to pray for our meal and stuff that we have together. If you're here and you're thinking about leaving, I, I usually want the best message for Sunday morning, the very first message, but I save the one that I think that speaks to my heart the most, the second message. There is some great things that the Lord wants us to hear this afternoon from his word. And I was almost going to flip the messages this morning because I felt so strongly in that, in that first one. So I want you to stay. Take in the second message. There are some great things that have to do with worship and entering in together as we worship together. Kind of an offset maybe a little bit from what we looked at here this morning where God's going to take us. And I know as I studied this week, God convicted my heart greatly. And that you could be under con conviction, but I want you to come. We'll eat a meal together. Come back. The power of the Holy Spirit pricking our hearts, changing our lives. That's what it's about. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord Jesus, for I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your timing, Lord, as we've been looking at your eight great covenants, Lord, as we tackle just a, li just a little surface piece, Lord, of the Mosaic covenant. Lord, all that it meant, that, that moral law, civil law, and the ceremonial law, Lord, I thank you for it. And Lord, more than anything, I thank you for how it points me to being a sinner in need of a Savior. And in it, I can see your grace being poured out. And I thank you, Jesus, that your grace has been poured out in my life. And Lord, you went to that cross and you died and you faced the curse for everyone. Father, we pray for more people to come to you. Thank you for your great words this morning. Lord, keep us in tune for this afternoon. Lord, the great things that you're going to speak to us, Lord. And I know it's hard for us to stay alert, Lord, and attentive. It is after we've had a great meal together. But bring us back in here, Lord, and allow us to be focused like you want us because there are some things. Lord Jesus, that you want us to hear from your word. I want to pray a blessing, Lord, upon our food. Lord, we thank you for every hand that's brought it. I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here this morning. I, I again want to pray, Lord, for those that aren't, that aren't amongst us, Lord, that, that normally are. Father, be with them in a special way. Guide and lead them, direct them. Lord, Thank you for the, the food, your provision. We honor you in it. We thank you for it. And we fellowship around it together. In Jesus' name, amen.